Welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast, where sales leaders teach you what's working for them and how you can build it yourself. This episode of the Predictable Revenue Podcast is brought to you by our sales coaching and consulting services. Are you looking to create repeatable, scalable, and predictable revenue? We've helped thousands of companies grow their business with tailored expert advice backed by testing to ensure they establish the best practices that'll work for them. Head over to bit.ly forward slash predictable revenue coaching to learn more. Traditional sales methodology has taught salespeople to be bullish, to have an answer to everything, to be smarter than their prospects, and to position themselves and their products as the biggest, the greatest, the best in the business. But that doesn't work anymore. And my guest is going to tell us why. I'm your host, Sarah Hicks. And today on the Predictable Revenue Podcast, I'm going to be chatting to an expert about why transparency sells better than perfection. He speaks and teaches revenue organizations on how to leverage transparency and decision science to maximize their revenue capacity with a focus on messaging, informal and formal, negotiations, and leadership. He wrote a three times award-winning book, The Transparency Sale, and he has another book coming out soon, The Transparent Sales Leader. Todd Capone, welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast. Wow, that was really good. Thanks for having me. You're so welcome. I'm so excited. Before we even dive into this transparency stuff, I have to say just having your research on you, looking at your stuff, tell me why sales melon. Why melon? Tell me why sales melon. All right. So this is, it's so obscure. Uh, I don't know if anybody remembers the movie, but it was Mike Myers and it was So I Married an Axe Murderer. So okay. for anybody that doesn't know the movie, like look it up on YouTube. There is a boy that has a giant head and uh, the, the Mike Myers character yells at him, just like, move that melon. And I've always <laughs> associated like what I do being kind of more brainy, more behavioral type associated with like, I want your brain to get so big that you need a bigger head. And so like literally when I started doing this, I was like, you know what, I'm going to write a book. People go, oh, good for you, Todd. You wrote a book. <laughs> then I'll go get a job again. So I just set up a company as Sales Melon kind of for fun. And here we are three and a half years later, the business is booming. And now I've got Sales Melon, but yeah, check out so yeah. Married and Axe Murderer. <laughs> Okay, perfect. We'll do. Um, okay, perfect. So let's let's work our way back on track here. So we're talking about transparency. We're talking about why there's been a big shift in the way people like to buy and therefore the way that people should sell. Um, and it's rooted in behavioral science. So tell me about that. Well, yeah, I, I would argue that it actually isn't much of a shift. I'm a sales mm -hmm. history nerd too. So for anybody watching this, like this book's from 1916. Like, I wish you could smell it because it smells like history, <laughs> but there's like a whole chapter on honesty and the, mm. the strength of selling through honesty. But here's the story. My last role, I was the chief revenue officer of a company here in Chicago called Power Reviews. And probably guess from the name that we were in the review space, right? So we helped retailers and brands collect and display ratings and reviews on their website. What happened was we did a research study with Northwestern University here in Chicago, just looking at, all right, when a website's acting as a salesperson, what do people do? Like, how do they interact? And there was three data points that came out of it, two of which changed my life like could only happen to a nerd. <laughs> but the first data point that didn't change my life was that we all read reviews today, right? Like the data came back that it was 96% of us will read reviews before we buy something of medium to high consideration that we haven't bought before. And I guess the only surprise there is that there was 4% at that time that still didn't. I, like, who are those people? But the two takers. data points that changed my life. Number one was that 85% of us skip the five-star reviews and go right to the negative reviews, right? So we read the fours, threes, twos, and ones first. But the last data point was that a product on a five-star scale that has an average review score between a four, two, and a four, five. And again, this is across all product categories. So some skew higher, some skew lower, but that is the optimal review star rating average for purchase conversion, meaning that a product that has a four, two, will actually sell at a higher rate than a product that's got nothing but perfect five-star reviews. And mm -hmm. being the nerd that I am, I looked at that and I was like, all right, that's weird. Like, why do we go to the negative first? Why do we need the negative to actually buy? But more importantly, that was when a website's acting as a salesperson. What happens when a human being is? And I found the correlation was almost exact, that it's basically the way we're wired, that we need the negative to be able to predict. We know subconsciously that perfection isn't real, 
And until we get that negative, we can't even process the positive. And we started trying it, magic happened. And I was like, all right, I got to get these ideas out there because we now know for sure that transparency sells better than perfection. But because of the proliferation of reviews and feedback and everything we do buy and experience today, we got to do it anyway. We can't hide flaws and expect to get away with it. That's the change. And what the book is about is like helping people see like, how do we do it? We're not supposed to go in and go, hey, this is why we suck, right? <laughs> like take it easy. The four, two to four, five is a pretty important delineation, but transparency sells better. We now have to do it anyway. Interesting. So how, how do we apply that to the sales process? Well, it could be in many ways, right? When I talk about transparency, it's about putting yourself truly in the shoes of the people that you're selling to and doing the homework for them, right? Because they're going to do the homework and help them to make a prediction. We don't buy when we're convinced. We buy when we can predict and that we've got a good feel that, hey, listen, the, the juice is going to be worth the squeeze. The outcome is going to match what I think it should. And it's a better way to spend my time, resources, energy than something else, right? And so being transparent is about doing the homework for the buyer. And that could be, hey, our competitors got something that we don't. If that's going to be important, can we had, like talk about that now? Our pricing is at the high end. If you're not cool with this kind of price range, let's talk about that now. When you do your homework, you're going to find that we had a bad experience with a customer like yours. Let's talk about that now, if that's something that's bugging you and talk about what we've learned. And if you're still not cool, like part as friends now. Mm. Like that's, that's what transparency is. It's lead with the elephant in the room, do the homework for the buyer that they're going to do anyway. And what you find is when they go do their own homework and find it matches, that's when your sales cycles speed up, your win rates go up, partially because you're qualifying deals in better that you should be winning, but partially because you're going to lose the deals you should lose anyway faster. And then the fun part is you make it really hard on your competitors to message against you when you do that. So that, that's kind of the core. I've got examples that we can talk through a little bit here. Yeah, too, but... yeah. let's dive into some examples at like specific little pinpointed places within the overall sales process. So yeah. let's talk about kind of back to, to kind of top of the funnel and um, talking about from an outbound perspective, how, how would you convert this into messaging? How, yeah, how do you demonstrate this in messaging? Yeah, I mean, from a prospecting perspective, it's a little bit more difficult. I think from a prospecting perspective, the way that I look at transparency is around you know, as a CRO, I was getting 100 to 150 emails per day. I was in 30 to 35 meetings per week. My mm -hmm. inbox was ugly, right? But I had to check it because it was kind of like, you know, you know, the scratch up off uh, instant lottery, you know, like yeah. you go get those things like you got to scratch it off because there might be a winner in there, but odds are it's losers, right? And that's how my <laughs> inbox was. And so I would like scan it in between meetings and I think number one is we've got to make sure that we're optimizing for the first 10 words in your email. Mm -hmm. Subject line to me doesn't matter anymore. At least it didn't as an executive reading my inbox. Every email has got a preview. And so on my Outlook, on my Gmail, on my phone, that's what I was scanning, right? So first of all, make sure you're optimizing for that. Number two is if your message starts with I or we, it's probably going to get deleted. And it's not that I don't love you. It's not that I don't think that what you're like, you're selling is fantastic. But if you're like, hey, I just wanted to check. I was wondering, I was hoping I could get 15 minutes with you. I was wondering if you got my last message. Listen, as an executive, if I were to list out my priorities, right? As a sales leader, the first three were my team, my customers, my prospects. Then there's a whole nother chunk of like my peers, my boss, my investors, my partners, my known vendors, all of that. Number 14 on the list was unknown potential vendors, right? So 14, that's where you're at. If your email comes in and it's, I wanted to, you stay at 14, right? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you're going to get deleted. For, for me, it's less about transparency and it's more about empathy that you've got a massive opportunity to stand out in the inbox by being personalized and being valuable and valuable means what are you doing in a unique way that's going to help me with my team, my customers, my prospects. That's how you move up. I think it just starts there, right? So 
clinical empathy with the inbox. And for all of you that are trying to figure out like, what, what does that look like? If you're selling to salespeople or sales executives, you probably have a sales executive that you have calls with once a week, right? Ask them to share their inbox. Ask them to share examples of what stands out. Ask them, what are they reading? What do they care about? What's top of mind? How do they get paid? What are their KPIs? And you can start to get really granular around how can I add value to the people I'm selling to. If you're selling to marketers, you probably have a CMO. If you're selling to product, you probably have somebody that runs product. If you're selling to finance, ask your CFO. I think there's so many opportunities to get to a level of empathy. And then that's where you start. Stand out. And then once the formal discussion, your messaging, your positioning starts, that's where you start to really embrace that transparency and help them predict. Very cool. Well, we're going to dive a little bit further down that process and dive into those examples as well. But I think you bring up a great point of uh, asking the people around you. I think we we don't take advantage of these resources around us quite often enough. And that was something when I was, you know, an SDR prospecting myself, uh, we we got a little snap, Slack channel set up where we would send in like the, the CEO, the CRO would send in like, Hey guys, I opened this one. I actually read through this one. I responded to this one. This is what worked for me. Um, just as a, as an example. So that's yeah. Great point. Um, yeah, let's talk more about then once you've got that engagement. So you're now having those live conversations with that prospect. How do you incorporate transparency here? Well, can I start with a relatable B2C example? Um, cause I think like that's a place to start because everybody knows this and it's, everybody's favorite retailer in the world, Ikea, right? Like it's a nightmare, right? Like Ikea, you walk in and you know you're in for it when they have to hand you a map, right? Like, you know, (laughs) this is gonna suck. And then you finally, you walk through the labyrinth of hallways, you can't find anything. You finally find what you're looking for. There's no salesperson around to help you. You have to like write the code or take a picture of it with your phone of where you're gonna find it in the warehouse downstairs. You go to the warehouse, you find the hundred pound boxes, you pull them somehow miraculously off onto a cart that doesn't have brakes. You then roll it into the parking lot where you have to back your car in and jam it into the back of your car Tetris style. You drive home with a souvenir injury or two thinking you just left the hell on earth back at the store. But no, now you get to open the box. There's 150 parts. There's no <laughs> words on the work instructions other than like Subarta or some weird uh, Scandinavian name. You put it together and you're like, you know what, this looks pretty good. We should have bought the end tables. Let's go back, right? And like, it seems so stupid. However, Ikea is one of those examples that I think the B2B world has an opportunity to learn from, which is embrace what you give up to be great at your core. Ikea says, hey, you're going to find it. You're going to pick it. You're going to jam it. You're going to assemble it. But we do that so we can give you modern Scandinavian design furniture you didn't pay much for. And if you walk into an Ikea right now and say, hey, listen, I need a salesperson that's going to design my living room and feng shui it, and then they're going to deliver the, like, and set it all up for me, they'd be like, cool, go down the street, room and board, crate and barrel, mate, like, they'll do it. Yeah. I think that's our opportunity. I mean, like, and there's so many examples, like at Costco and Southwest Airlines, Progressive Insurance, mm-hmm. like there's mm-hmm. tons of these organizations that are saying, hey, listen, we're not all things to all people. This is what we're good at. This is what we're not qualify in, qualify out, attract people to you and your company that are pre-qualified. Huge opportunity there. When we take that to the B2B world, I'll I'll tell you the story of the first time this happened um, and the first time I tried it because I was like, I had a theory. I tried it and it was crazy how magic happened. But I was uh, an apparel retailer up in the Northeast, up in New York. The the I'll try to shorten the story here as much as I can for you. What happened was I was in New York. I had a whole afternoon cancel. My VP of sales back in Chicago texted me saying, hey, we just got an inbound lead from this incredible manufacturer apparel company up in New York. And I was like, New York? Cool. Tell me about it. And they're like, well, they're going to issue an RFP. And then we're going to fly to New York and do this whole dog and pony. Sh-. And I was like, hey, there's a one in a hundred shot here. So don't put any pressure on the rep, but could you have the rep reach back out to their head of e-commerce and ask them if they might want to grab coffee? Cause I am in New York. I've got a few hours open. Like that would be cool to kind of kick off the relationship that way. Rep does. The guy says, yes. Like what are the odds? 
I don't know what the expectations were, but when I got there, I checked in, we went to his office. As we walked into his office, the guy hands me the HDMI cable from his monitor. And he's like, here, this is for, you can plug into your uh, laptop for your presentation. And I was just like, um, like co coffee? We <laughs> coffee, like what happened? Um, as I'm like, the wheels are turning and I'm going crazy. I look to my right and people are wheeling chairs into the room. And it wasn't just people, it was like seven of them. So now we're in his office, hot Manhattan office. There's nine of us like elbow to elbow. And this guy goes right after me, like New York style in the best mm -hmm. way possible. Like there was no small talk. It was just like, Todd, listen, we're talking to you. We're talking to your competitor. How are you better? And like, I could feel all the eyes in the room on me. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to try it. And so here's what transparency sounded like in this world. I, our competitor had just released an add-on that we didn't have. So I decided to start with it and say, hey, listen, before we get too deep into it, get a lot of people here, they're putting together an RFP, we we're going to be flying people around, but can I share how they're better than us? They actually just released an add-on that we don't have. We weren't anticipating. It's not even on our roadmap. And if that's going to be an important consideration, can we vet that now mm -hmm. and maybe save each other a ton of time? immediately you could feel the whole vibe in the room kind of calm down. They started asking me about it. They're like, we hadn't even heard about it. What is it? And I was like, well, here's what it is. Here's what it does. They're beta customers in the apparel space like you. And we went back and forth. They kept coming back. Like, what would you do if we needed that? I'm like, I don't know. They just came out with it yesterday. Like we haven't even <laughs> talked about it, right? Within about 10 minutes, they came back and they're like, listen, not an, a consideration for us. It sounds interesting, but we wouldn't even get to that for probably a couple of years. I'm like, all right, cool. Remember, they're first customers in the apparel space. Like, you know, like make sure they're like, yeah, we're cool. And then I talked about our kind of four, two to four, five. Here's the magic. About 15 minutes later, the head of e-commerce kicks the other seven people out of his office saying, hey, if I heard, have you all heard enough? And they're like, yeah, we're cool. I'm like, all right, good. They all leave. He literally pulled a folder off his credenza, opened it up. It was his budget. And he points at the fifth line down and he's like, can you hit it? Now, I'd never actually seen a buyer's budget, especially in the first 25 minutes of a meeting. And we end up having this dialogue. 10 days later, after I'd left, he called me personally to let me know that they're not doing the RFP. There's going to be no flying around. They're ready to get to it. And they've chosen us. And so we ended up taking what would have been a six-month sales cycle and boiled it down to about six weeks after a few weeks of T's and C's and contracts and everything. But that's the point. Help the buyer predict. That's how this works, right? Mm -hmm. Transparency. This is what we're great at. This is what we're not. We don't do those ancillary things. We're awesome at this. And if you're cool with that, you're going to love us. And if you're not, you're going to love them. And that's where the magic happened. And we became Chicago's fastest growing tech company. Amazing. And it makes sense. Like you're saying, you're, you're qualifying people in, but you're qualifying people out. You're just not bothering with the whole song and the dance of like, are we a good fit? Let's not mention the things that are not a perfect fit, hoping that we'll sell them on the things that are a good fit. And, and all these things that probably just create hiccups further down the road. Whereas you're just laying your cards out on the table and saying like, look, this is what we've got. If this is right for you, let's move forward. If this is not right for you, there's another company that's right for you. And we want that for you. Exactly. We want you to have the best fit. That is exactly it. I mean, the options are, would you rather that messaging of the add-on come from your competitor or from you? That's yeah. number one. Number two, would you rather that they find out however four months from now, after you just filled out an RFP and you flew five mm. people back and forth in New York and you just spent months on this opportunity, or would you rather know now? Like for me, the answer is obvious, like own it, control the message, qualify in or out immediately and move on. And the magic with that too, is let's say it was important. Let's say they were like, yeah, you know what? We probably would like that. What have you also done? You've built trust like with every interaction, you're either building trust or eroding it. And what ends up happening is they're like, oh man, well, that sucks that you don't have it, but let's talk about what you're great at because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. subconsciously there's an endearing factor to that. Like I do that in my own business. I'll have people come to me asking me like, hey, Todd, we need like one-on-one -on -one coaching on prospecting. I'm like, cool. Here's three people you can talk to. And they're like, wait, you don't do that? I'm like, no, I don't do that. <laughs> Here's what I do. 
And yeah. it, it, the, the amazing part about it is how that ends up building trust and endearing the buyers to you. And it's not using behavioral science for evil. It's telling the truth, <laughs> right? Yeah. If the truth won't sell it, don't sell it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's that whole idea that that every salesperson wants to become that trusted advisor to the people that they're trying to sell to. And you do that not necessarily by pushing yourself the whole right. time. It's, exactly. ju it's just through honesty and, and value, as you mentioned, bringing value as your kind of top priority, regardless of where you are in the sales cycle. And um, there's one other kind of specific spot in the sales cycle that I'd love to talk about how to leverage transparency. And it's around kind of later stage negotiations. Yes. Um, how do we factor it in there? Oh, gosh, that's my favorite. Uh, <laughs> so here's the thing. I don't know about you or anybody who's listening to this, but like, don't you think it's weird? that we require a different personality to negotiate than we do to sell. Like that always bothered me. It always bothered me that we build trust. We get the buyer to the goal line. The customer says, yeah, I'm going to buy from you. And then you subconsciously go, all right, cool. I'm going to start lying to you now. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to use techniques that I learned from former FBI hostage negotiators, right? Like, yeah, like that, that just, it seems crazy to me. Like, don't get me wrong. Like Chris Foss's book is one of my favorites. It combines my three favorite things, right? Like behavioral science, FBI intrigue, you know, sales, like it's, it's fantastic. But in a SaaS environment, I think we've got to get out of this belief that the transaction is the kind of the end of the sales relationship. And then it goes to somebody else in a SaaS environment, that transaction is the beginning of your relationship. If you want customers that are going to stay, buy more and advocate, you got to be building trust to the goal line instead of eroding it. And there's a simple way to do it. The, the concept of transparent negotiation was another one of those circumstances where I kind of tried it accidentally and the result was magic. But it was, I walked into a high stakes negotiation. They had brought their whole procurement team. A couple of them were drooling like, oh yeah, I can't wait to get after this guy. And I was like, oh crap. And I threw my cards face up on the table. And here's what it sounds like. For our company, but for every for-profit company in the world, there's four things that you care about, right? You care about volume, so how much they buy. You care about timing of cash, so how fast they pay. You care about length of commitment, so how long they commit. And you care about the timing of the deal, which is when they sign, like when they, they formalize this thing. And so... Transparent negotiation is essentially walking into a negotiation, but even earlier when you're presenting your price, when you're proposing your price and telling the customer, hey, listen, our pricing is based on these four things. You know, we, your pricing right now is based on you're buying this much volume. So you've earned a discount based on that, uh, but it's in that 30 annual upfront, a two-year commitment, you know, like you start there. Mm -hmm. Then you make sure that's clear in the proposal. When it comes to the negotiation, and the customer starts asking for stuff, those are the four things that you're willing to pay them for in the form of a discount, right? Commit mm -hmm. to more volume, we'll pay you in the form of a discount. Pay us faster, we'll pay you in the form of a discount. Commit longer, we'll pay you in the form of a discount. Help us forecast our business, not only because we've got investors and all of that that care, but we've got resources we need to deploy and our ability to forecast is immeasurably valuable. We'll pay you in the form of a discount to mutually align around the timing right? Versus the fake expiring discount. What ends up happening is that you, uh, the, the buyer gains confidence in your pricing. Number two is you get value for every dollar or every concession you give away. Number three is your deals become infinitely more predictable, especially if you play that fourth lever, right? And then the fourth one is you've built trust to the goal line instead of eroding it. And if you do it right, your client success team or your account management team that's doing the upsell, cross-sell, renewal, they'll remember it and they'll be negotiating this stuff on their own in perpetuity. It's, it's really, really cool how this one works. It's the most popular class that I teach, but it's, you know, again, it kind of flies in the face of traditional. And again, like we don't get to tase the person we're negotiating with after the deal and drag them off the jail. You got to have a relationship yeah. with them. And I think this is the way forward. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and you're right. It is very cool to kind of think about that. I think discounts are kind of used either as you're mentioning, kind of like a strange coercion sort of technique or 
or like a crutch or a cop out. They're not often used kind of intentionally and in a way that, as you mentioned, is going to both build trust, set you up for a longer term relationship. Um, and in SaaS, as you mentioned, that's so important. To, we're not looking for a one-time purchase here. We're looking for you to stick around forever. And it's another point, actually, going back to our qualify and qualify out, those people that you qualify in or that qualify themselves in are more likely to stick around for longer. They're, they're yeah, not going to have been kind of, you know, what is it, round peg, square hole. We've sort of squashed right. them in there, and then they're going to yeah. figure out pretty quickly that they're not a fit. So all of these things both contribute, obviously, to a positive relationship that you're having with the customer through that journey, but it's going to pay dividends in, in revenue which is important to, to everybody Absolutely. in the revenue generating org. Yeah. I mean, like when you think about, um, you know, imagine that like you've got a, a sweater or like a, something like a piece of clothing that you really like, and all of a sudden like there's a hole in it, or it's like a sweater that you accidentally put mm -hmm. in the wash and ruined. And it's the beginning of November. Now, what do you do? Like, do you go find another one and buy it? Well, or do you wait? three weeks for Black Friday when you know that everybody's going to discount. Mm -hmm. You probably wait. Like, I don't need the sweater. I'd like to have it right now. But if I'm going to get 50% off in three weeks, I'm going to wait as long as possible and see if it, maybe it even gets better. Now, the reason I bring that up is that there's an irony in our fake expiring discounts. Like, I used to do this as a sales leader. I'd tell the team, like, hey, listen, let's get all of our buyers rallying around you know, like right now we're talking, it's Q1. Let's say mm -hmm. I'm like, hey, um, let's rally everybody around end of March. And let, let's just tell our customers right now, 10% off if they, they get it done by the end of March. The ironic thing about it is that actually incentivizes a buyer to wait. Because what happens? If you're a buyer and you know that that's important, aren't you subconsciously thinking, well, that was easy. Maybe I'll wait until right until the goal line and I'll ask for more. Like, how yeah. hard could that be? I mean, you're you're literally creating the opposite. You're eroding trust in your pricing. You're eroding the value of your deals right out of the gate. The minute that you give away anything for free is the minute you've signaled to your buyer that they should ask for more. Mm -hmm. I know that I do it. And anybody who's ever bought anything in the history of earth knows <laughs> that those expiring discounts are not only fake, but they know that if they get it for not even asking anything, there's more to be had. Yeah, exactly. That's it. It's not a trade-off. It's just a, it's just for free. It's just out yeah, of nowhere. Exactly. It's just yeah. like you walk down the street and stumble down a rock and there's 20 bucks under it. You're like, yeah. what other rocks could I, like, I'm going to go step on all of them and slow yeah. down my whole walk instead of taking the path that I was on. And you're literally yeah. slowing down your buyers by doing it. Just stop it. Exactly. And while we're on the analogy train, because one just popped into my head, I don't know if you watch Seinfeld, but I'm thinking as we were talking about the clothes and the whole when Elaine went shopping and looked beautiful in the dress and it was because she was in front of a skinny mirror. She was not then happy about that purchase. That doesn't, you know, she's not coming back and buying dress after dress after dress. She knows she was duped that one time and she's not going back again. Oh, exactly. So, trust. Yeah. You're either eroding, you're either building or eroding trust with every interaction. Right. Absolutely. And, and like when we, you talked about prospecting earlier. I got like somebody sent me an email a few days ago that was, it was, it, it started out by sounding like it was meant for me. Like it was, it said, hello. And then in parentheses, it said first name. And then right under it, it was like, haha, just kidding, Todd. Um, hey, I was, I was studying your website and determined that uh, it looks like we would be a perfect fit for you. And I was like, oh, that's a good way to start. What they do is they do, um, it's like coding and high level engineering for oh, like no. high tech companies, right? Like they were going through this whole thing. And I was just like, dude, like, I, I think you just tried to dupe me with this message here that reeled me in. Yeah. What high engineering responsibilities do I have? Like I run a training and speaking company. like, what the, yeah. what the heck are you talking? What did you find? Right. Yeah. And so like, that's one of those instances where we're, you, you like save the, the magic tricks for your junior high daughter's uh, birthday <laughs> party, right? Like keep them out of sales like, because what you're doing is if you have to convince somebody or you trick somebody to bring them in, the downstream impacts of that in a negative way, mm -hmm. you'll never reel yourself back out of. Absolutely. I think that's a, a perfect place to leave us off. I want to give our audience one little tidbit because you mentioned right at the beginning, you love the history of sales. You've got mm -hmm. that wonderful little old book. Give me a cool fact about sales in the past. Um, I can give you a depressing one. <laughs> love it. <laughs> yeah. Well, so what I just stumbled on recently was a um, hundred years ago, 
So 1922, the sales profession, which had been on the upswing and kind of similar to today, there was you know high demand, low supply of salespeople. Um, you know, salaries were going up. Salespeople were moving around a lot. Mm -hmm. 1922, though, the sales turnover, so turnover of salespeople was 85 percent, and not in a good way. Mm -hmm. And so the reason that I bring that up because it, it's top of mind for me. I'm like, how did that happen? How did we go from two years earlier to having a boom going on? And within two years, we had what I call the great salesperson purge of the 1920s. I just think that when we look at today and our environment, and for anybody that's listening to this, you know, be really intentional about your career. Be really intentional, intentional about the choices that you're making and attach yourself to things that you're passionate about. Because if you're chasing money, and we end up having any kind of correction coming in the next couple of years, which I mean, we as a profession tend to step on the same rake over and over again anyway, like it's probably coming to a certain extent, just like make sure that you get into a good place where it's solid, you've got passion for it, and you're making things happen. Because I think the people that are bouncing around chasing money right now, that there could be some things to be worried about there. Mm. So that's my my interesting stat from a hundred years ago is a eighty five percent salesperson turnover in a single year exactly a hundred years ago, mm -hmm. and it's just like again if we don't know history are we doomed to repeat it? Maybe hopefully not to that extent. But that's just one of the the nerdy things that I dig into. I've got a podcast called the Sales History Podcast. If anybody wants to check it out and give it a listen, it's just me monologuing on different topics. <laughs> from like when did cold calling begin to old sales methodologies to you know, our, our origins of sales management and you know 20 other subjects so very cool yeah spooky foreboding everyone be careful <laughs> wonderful <laughs> exactly. wonderful way to end it off and um, thank you so much todd for joining us yeah incredible having you so much great tactical stuff to take away there through the entire you know buyer journey customer journey um if people want to learn more from you if they want to get in touch with you other than listening to your history podcast where can they get in touch with you yeah, I mean, my website's toddcapone.com. So that'll link you to everything, tons of free resources, blog posts, videos, all that. And then, you know, follow or connect on LinkedIn. If you'd like, I share a lot of my nonsense there, but it'd be <laughs> cool if you let me know where you heard me, uh, that certainly would help. So that's it. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much again, Todd. Thank you to all of you for joining us on another episode of the Predictable Revenue Podcast. We love having you. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button on YouTube so that you can be notified each week when we have wonderful guests like Todd Capone joining us and sharing wonderful tips and tricks about sales and all other things related to that. We'll catch you next time.